Welcome back, everyone, from the coffee break. Now, at the beginning of this, uh, this afternoon, Pablo asked you all to get out your mobile phones and have a look at them. Now, that was really great, so I want to ask you to all do it again. <laughs> Seriously, take out your mobile phone. Aren't they just an amazing, amazing thing? Such a, all the human technology and design, and uh, not to mention entertainment, which is crammed into this amazing little package, I couldn't live without mine. Surely one of the most impressive things that we've invented. Now, look down about 10 centimeters. What are you looking at now? The thing that's holding your mobile phone. I'm going to show you today that this device, and in particular the way that it builds itself, is actually far more impressive than the mobile phone itself. In fact, probably more impressive than anything we've invented. So on with the talk. This is you. This is you, aged four, four weeks. And can anyone recognize this? Well, it's not holding a mobile phone yet. <laughs> now, over the next two weeks, this little bump on the side of your body is going to do something amazing. It's going to multiply. The cells in there are going to multiply from a few thousand to a few million. And more importantly, they're going to organize themselves. The cells are going to change until they form a small version of your arm. Now, this is obviously amazing. And I would love to show you a movie, a real movie of real cells performing this task, but I can't, and I'll come back to that later, because it hasn't been achieved. So what I'm going to show you instead are three movies from three quite different fields of science, each of which highlight one or two of the key characteristics of this very complicated process. It also serves to tease out the different aspects of the system. So we'll start with these cells. These are bacterial cells sitting in a dish. And much like your early organ-forming cells, they're a small group at the beginning, and they're more or less all the same. And they're going to do two very important things. They're going to multiply so that your hand can get bigger. And they're going to change form. They're going to change into different cell types, as you can see, the red ones, the green ones. And this is much like what the cells in your arm have to do. They have to change into muscle cells and bone cells and nerve cells. However, there's clearly one thing missing in this example. The structure that you see there is not at all organized. These are just individual bacteria. They're not cooperating to build something. So we have to move to another field, and we'll move to the field of robotics and multi-agent systems. Now, these robots are running around the floor. And unlike the bacteria, they're not dividing. Not very clever. Also, unlike the bacteria, they're not changing into different types. But also, unlike the bacteria, you'll see they are doing something better than the bacteria, they're cooperating to build something, something bigger than themselves. In this case, it's the logo of the lab in Switzerland which is doing this robotics work. So we can imagine this multi-robot arrangement as a multicellular structure, like your hand, where the muscle cells, the nerve cells, and the bone cells have all positioned themselves in exactly the right place to make your hand work. So this is, of course, critical. But there's something missing here as well, which is, how do these robots know where to go? How did they get to the right spot to make this logo? Well, in this man-made example, in fact, each robot had access to very accurate information about its position on the floor. In effect, each robot has a GPS and a map. Now, real biological cells do not have GPS. So we have to move to a third example to find the last characteristic of our own biological cells. And now we go to the field of complexity theory, and you won't be able to tell necessarily what these little dots are in the movie until I start playing it. These are actually birds. Lots of little black birds about this big called starlings. I think it's estornei in Catalan. And when I start running the movie, you'll see that they do an amazing thing. Now, one of the questions is, of course, why they're doing that. And there are many theories. But another question for a long time has been, how do they manage to do this? We happen to know that there's no master bird telling the rest what to do. There's no centralized control. Instead, each bird is simply following the same set of instructions, which means it looks at its immediate neighbors and adjusts its flight accordingly. Somehow, out of all these local, fairly simple rules, a large-scale structure emerges. Now, it seems a bit reminiscent of the robots, many individuals coming together and collaborating to make something bigger than themselves. But of course, in this case, they're doing it without GPS. So 
we have these three different examples, and they're from three, three very different fields of science. And in each case, scientists are trying to understand how this particular thing works, or in the case of the robots, how to program them so they can cooperate and uh, achieve something bigger than themselves. Now, the system that we're interested in is actually a combination of all of these things. So I said I couldn't show you a movie of real cells forming a hand, but I can show you a computer animated cartoon, a kind of artist's impression of something very similar. And this is the fact that the adult salamander, unlike ourselves, if it loses its arm about here, it has the regenerative power to regrow the entire arm in a couple of months. So we'll watch this movie. So first of all, you'll see these little colored circles moving around. These are the cells, and the colors are kind of indicating that they're making different decisions, decisions to become bone or nerve, et cetera. And hopefully all this activity is reminiscent of the previous movies that I just showed you. These cells are multiplying and changing their form like the bacteria, but they're doing it in an exquisitely organized way like the robots, but they're doing it without GPS. So of course the miracle is, how do they do this? And the reason why this animation was made, it was made by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in America, is because of the increasing excitement that if we could understand this kind of process well enough, we may be able to stimulate similar regenerative powers even in humans. So this is our million dollar question. How does it work? And just to be clear, we're not talking about how do the cells move. In all of these examples that I've been showing you, we know how the things move. The birds have wings, the robots have wheels, and of course our cells, well, they also have their own little arms and legs called philopodia, which allow them to run around on top of each other to move. But that's not the question. The question is, how do they know what to do? How do they know where to move? How do they know which cell type to turn into and in the right place at the right time? And to be honest, this is still pretty much a mystery. So how are we going to study it? Well, the traditional reductionist approach has been to take a given system and say, what is it made of? What are the pieces of the puzzle? So let's look at the pieces of the puzzle in these three systems here, cellular system, the robots, and the birds. Well, if we start with the birds, it was in fact a Spanish Nobel Prize winning neurobiologist, Ramon y Cajal, who unraveled what the pieces of this puzzle were over 100 years ago here in Barcelona. And of course, these pieces are nerve cells, very specialized, complicated cells that are connected into a very complicated network in the brain, which allows the bird to make its decisions. If we go to the case of the robots, its onboard brain, its onboard computer, is also composed of millions and millions of little simple units, which are little electronic switches called transistors. And they are wired together also to, to create a kind of control network, allowing it to make decisions. And the last couple of decades of molecular biology has shown that cells are similar. They're controlled by genes and proteins, but these genes and proteins are also wired together into a complex control network. In fact, the switching on and off of different genes is a bit related to the decisions that these cells are making, of whether to become a muscle cell or a nerve cell. So reductionism has shown us what the pieces are, but how much does this help us understand how the thing actually works? Now, because in other fields, in particular in physics and chemistry, Finding and then studying the pieces of the puzzle has often been able to help us understand the system. In biology also, we've had a very strong drive to always look for the smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of the puzzle. In fact, we heard earlier today about amazing new microscopes, and there are many new kinds of microscopes being developed that allow us to see inside the cell and then inside the nucleus and down to the level of the DNA and to individual protein molecules. In fact, we've invented other kinds of machines as well. We've invented machines for sequencing the entire genome, which gives us an entire list of all the genes in our body, a list of all the bits and pieces of the puzzle. But it's increasingly become clear that biology is more than the sum of the parts. If we take the bird example, you could do all the experiments you can imagine on an individual bird. You could take all the measurements, you could image all the cells, and you would never be able to predict from that that if you took 1,000 birds, put them in the sky, they're going to form these kind of shapes. And part of the reason for that is because these systems are actually little information processing systems. They take information in, 
The control circuit allows the system to make a decision. And in fact, this is true for all three of the systems that we've got here. Now, you wouldn't expect to be able to understand a computer, for example, the computer on the robots, by studying just a few of the transistors. And in fact, the same is true for the other systems as well. We have this one layer of complexity in terms of the fact they're all little computers. We also have the extra layer of complexity. They're huge groups of computers com communicating with each other. So we would not expect to be able to understand everything they do by taking them apart. We have to find a new way to study the system and a new way which allows us to put the pieces back together. So how are we going to do that? That sounds like a bit of a challenge. How do you study something without taking it apart? Well, in fact, we know how to do that. And it comes in two parts. The first is making a movie, and the second is replicating the movie. And I will illustrate that with the example of the birds. So making a movie of the birds, very easy. You just go down to FNAC, buy a camcorder, and start filming them. If we were really clever, we might notice, well, there's so many birds, we can hardly distinguish them. Let's tag a few of the birds, maybe with little lights, so that we can distinguish a subset of them, and maybe we'll see them more clearly flying around. So what about replicating the movie? What does that mean? Well, for replicating the movie, we in fact need a kind of experimental flock of birds. We need a flock of birds where we can play around with the instructions, the, 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 the computer, and see what kind of program in this computer would replicate this, uh, this behavior? What kind of architecture of the neural circuit, for example? So we need experimental birds. The obvious thing that we have to do is build an army of a few thousand little robotic flying birds, put them up in the sky, and start playing with them. That would be the best toy ever. I would love it. In fact, Alfred Hitchcock would have really loved it. So of course, this is not really going to be possible. We have to find another way. The other way is maybe uh, quite easy to imagine. Do the whole thing in a computer. And this has been done. We can make an experimental flock of birds in a computer. And in this computer model, we can explore all the kind of rules that we like for what the birds are doing and see which ones will replicate the movie. So the idea is make a movie which means simply record all the details of the system we want to understand, and then explore this in a computer, replicate the movie in a computer model. So this, in a nutshell, is what we're trying to do in my lab for this system, which I would argue is far more complicated than these birds. And I'm just now going to go through a few examples of the kind of things going on in the lab to highlight the, the, the challenges. Um, it's a long road that we're going on. We still have a long way to go. Um, and also to illustrate a bit of the interdisciplinary nature of this work, which is another feature of this kind of work, which is sometimes called systems biology. So the first thing that was quite interesting is um, we wanted to make a movie of this process. We wanted to take images of this developing limb bud. And a little bit maybe because of this um, obsession, you could say, or drive for, of, for reductionism to look at smaller and smaller pieces, which has provided us with tons of useful information. Nevertheless, it turned out that there wasn't actually a kind of camera or a kind of microscope that could image the entire thing in one go. So to cut a long story short, the first thing that we had to do was actually invent a new kind of imaging technology. And this is called optical projection tomography. Now, what we were able to do with that, one of the examples that I can show you, is create data that is a bit reminiscent of this artist's impression I showed you before. In the artist's impression, on the right, the different cells are different colors because they're making different choices about what to do. Now, on the left, what you see is real data from our imaging technology of the states of different genes. For example, the red gene and the green gene are higher and lower in different regions. And this actually reflects decisions that they're making. We don't understand all the decisions that they're making. And this is another way of highlighting a bit the problem of reductionism. We actually know many, many genes, and we can even look at them and see how they're distributed. And we know that they have something to do with a kind of a decision to become a hand rather than the arm. Um, but we don't actually know what decisions each, each gene is making. So another example of what we've been able to do is a bit like the idea I mentioned about the birds. We can tag a small subset of the cells, because at this point in the developing limb bud, as it's called, there's already nearly half a million cells. It's too many to look at all of them at once. So here, 
we have tagged a subset of them. And by looking at the way they're spread out over space, we can get some idea of the movement. Because the other issue here is that most of our data is coming from fixed uh, tissue samples, not from live tissue. And so we have to do clever tricks to actually recreate the movie of how everything's happening. So these are the machines that we're developing in the lab. These are the kind of images that we can take. And then we go to the computer scientists. The computer scientists can take these kind of images and start to pinpoint in, th in 3D coordinates the position of each cell that we've tagged, play around with it, put it into a model of, of the developing limb. And most importantly, this allows us to actually combine the results from many different experiments. And then we can do fun things like just sort of doing a fly through the limb bud. This is the, uh, the really fun part of the work because you start to almost get a feeling of what it must be like to develop a limb from the inside. And this is where also the engineers come in because from this kind of data, and I'm not going to go into details, we can start to use engineering software to work out what the movements must be. And this is uh, an image showing the kind of swirling tissue movements that we believe occurs during limb development, which has been extracted from the data that we've developed from the imaging techniques. So this is already a collaboration between physicists, computer scientists, and engineers. And I'm not showing most of the work that goes on in the lab, of course. Needless to say, we're just doing a lot of this uh, work of gathering the data, making the movie. So the last part of the challenge, of course, is replicating the movie. And this is still at the beginning, I would say. I can show you a couple of preliminary examples here. On the bottom is a, a movie of our computer simulation. And in the top is some data about the choices that some cells are making to become the skeleton. The cells that are blue are the ones that are deciding to become bone, because they're going to make your skeleton. In the bottom, what we have is not a movie. It's an actual simulation. It means that we've programmed the cells in the tissue that's growing to implement the kind of gene network, the kind of uh, control system that we believe is happening, to explore in what way this gene network has to be organized to replicate the real movie. So the top is, as it were, a movie. It's a series of snapshots of the movie. And the bottom is a computer replication of this process. That one was two-dimensional, and I'll just show you one other one here, which is three-dimensional, showing the very early part of this process. So those are just a few glimpses of what's going on in the lab. And as the last point, we would say, why the limb? This is our challenge, to build a computer simulation of this complicated process, which hopefully I've illustrated how beautiful and complicated we think it is. So why pick the limb? Well, there are a few direct practical reasons. When the instructions in this code that we're trying to understand go wrong, get mutated, some patients end up with uh, developmental defects in the limbs. We already know that some of the genes involved in limb development are also involved in cancer. And of course, there's the tantalizing prospect of regeneration in the future. But I would also like to make the more general point, which is that in biology, we need some kind of grand scientific challenges to help us go beyond reductionism, to help us focus on a way of getting beyond all the pieces. And this, choosing the limb, we, we could choose other organs, but this is our choice of a, of a system that will help us go forwards and try to integrate uh, all this information to try to, as a way of using computer simulations to put the pieces of the puzzle back together again. Because at the end of the day, in order to cure living systems, we think we should have to understand living systems first. So thank you very much. <laughs>